Welcome to lesson number nine, Relational Healing. While we all deeply desire to be in healthy, loving relationships, many of us struggle with those that are around us, um, often those closest to us. Uh, the truth is, is that uh, many of us have relationships that are not well uh, or even broken. In this lesson, we'll discuss how through prayer, we can bring healing to these troubled relationships. Now, this is not another method of counseling uh, like Jesus is healing in other areas of our life. In this lesson, we'll learn how to partner with God to do with His wisdom and strength what is impossible to do in our wisdom and strength. Let's begin with a quick scriptural overview in order to lay a theological foundation for relational healing. God created humankind to be in intimate relationships. In the beginning, God declared all things good except for one thing. It was not good for Adam to be alone. God, being in uh, the Trinity, uh, was always in community. In the same way, man created in the image of God was made for community. So God created Eve uh, so that man would not be alone. He created her out of his side. And just as he did that, he then brought them back together again so they could become one. Adam, when he first saw Eve, declared, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Only together with Eve was only in community, only in relationship was Adam truly whole. And together, Adam and Eve lived in intimacy with God and with each other. Adam and Eve passed on their relational brokenness to their children. Um, Cain, for example, killed his brother Abel. They then passed this on to their children. Um, and then the, the violence and the wickedness and the broken relationships grew into the point that uh, in the sixth gen chapter of Genesis, we read how, that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human race was evil all the time. Imagine the brokenness of the relationships or imagine the violence that people were visiting upon each other. Imagine the father's grief at watching his children war with each other and ruin themselves and ruin his good earth. Um, the Lord regretted that he had made human, human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I've created. And yet in the midst of this, there was Noah. And the Lord found Noah to be as a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And he walked faithfully with God. So blameless among the people of his time. So his relationships with other people were without blame. He acted generously and lovingly with them, but then also he walked faithfully with God. We see how these two things are interconnected, our relationships with God and our relationships with each other. And with Noah and his family, God decided to redesign, remake, recreate humanity upon the earth. God's project of redemption began in earnest with the call of Abram and Sarai. Uh, with them, he made a covenant uh, that was the foundation of a kingdom of restored relationships that would create a community that would bless all the earth. God said in Genesis 17, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. This is all about a promise that God made to restore the relationships between them and him and them and each other. However, if you read further in Genesis, uh, you'll see that this first family and the, the generations after them 
had a lot of problems. I mean, they had a lot of problems. Their, their dysfunctional family problems um, will give you hope for you and your family's dysfunction. And hope especially because over this group of people, God continually speaks blessing. He continues to uh, reiterate his promise uh, of commitment to them and to their descendants um, that, that through them he would reveal his purposes, his healing, his deliverance, his redemption uh, of all the earth. With Moses, God clarified his relational expectations for us with the law. Take the Ten Commandments. The first tablet was all about God spelling out his intentions for us relating with God. And with the second tablet, it was all about commandments for how we are to relate to each other. Um, Moses also set up a system of worship and sacrifice that covered the sin of the people so that God could draw near to them in intimacy again. And then God gave them the land, the land of Israel, where um, he wanted them to live out uh, the law and with the worship in community there of restored relationships to be a witness to the people uh, around the world of what God's intentions were uh, for us to being in community with God and with each other. However, despite these gifts of the law and worship in the land, uh, God's people struggled to live in these faithful covenantal relationships with each other and with God. So God sent prophets and they said, they, they were constantly um, drawing them back uh, to following the law in order to, to live in covenantal faithfulness. Um, Isaiah, for example, in chapter 58 said, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? And when you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. You see how all of this has to do with the importance of God saying, don't do these religious activities of fasting as much as I want you to be generous and loving with those around you, sacrificially so. And finally, at the very end uh, of the Old Testament, the very last couple of verses from Malachi, um, we see, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So one last time God is saying how much he values loving relationships within our families. The Gospel of Luke picks right up where Malachi ended. In the first chapter, um, we read of Gabriel coming to give uh, or announce to Zechariah, the priest, about John the Baptist, his son, and about his call. Uh, Gabriel said, and he, John the Baptist, will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient uh, to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John the Baptist came in order to, through restored relationships between fathers and children and also between the rich and the poor, uh, this is how he's going to prepare a people ready for the Lord, for the coming Messiah. And then the Messiah came, Jesus. And Jesus also stressed the importance of these restored relationships. Uh, once when he was teaching, a teacher of the law came up and said, Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment that was given to us by God through Moses? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love of God, love of each other, restored relationships. And this was a command that came through Moses because uh, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Uh, on this very uh, last night before he was uh, betrayed, before he's arrested, when he's talking to disciples, he taught on the importance of love and how it should be um, 
the last commandment he wanted to give them. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The kingdom that Jesus was setting up uh, was gonna be founded upon his example of love and love that he wishes for us as his disciples to model. However, like our first parents, like the families of the patriarchs, like the nation of Israel, we as the church, the community of the beloved, as those that have been called to establish a community of love that is an example to all the world, we often struggle to love each other, to love each other, to fulfill Jesus' commandment. And it's not because we don't want to, it's just that we lack the strength, the courage, the wisdom, especially the power to be able to affect the change necessary to love those uh, around us, especially those that we're in conflict with. The good news is that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit from him and the Father in order to empower us to do what is impossible for us to do on our own. Um, even as Jesus was giving his commandment to his disciples, he knew that they weren't gonna be able to fulfill this command of love apart from the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. The same is true for us. We can only love and forgive as Jesus loved and forgave uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. The foundation to relational healing is a wholehearted, active dependence upon God. Now we just talked about uh, a reliance upon God the Holy Spirit for wisdom, courage, and power to begin to, to change the ways that we act in our relationships. But even deeper than that uh, is a wholehearted dependence upon God our Heavenly Father, upon His um, uh, providence. Uh, providence is the old-fashioned doctrine that God has provided everything in our lives for life and godliness, and this includes our relationships. So imagine for a moment that the people in which you're in conflict with, imagine them as a gift. Um, imagine for a moment that the very parts of those relationships that are driving you crazy are a gift to be embraced and learned from, not a problem to be managed or, or avoided. This is the very foundation, this acceptance of the people around us, especially those we're in conflict with, uh, is the foundation of beginning to heal those relationships. I'll give you an example from my own life. Well, years ago, uh, in my first ordained call as a Presbyterian pastor, uh, I was a week into the call when I fell afoul of my senior pastor. Uh, he just didn't seem to think that I could do anything right, or at least that's the way it appeared to me. Every week I was being called into his office to be corrected, to get my wings clipped. <laughs> and I just got more and more depressed. I just didn't like being there. And I cried out to God, I said, please release me from this church. But all I received in answer to prayer was either silence or do you trust me? Well, this went on for three and a half years. Uh, I actually went into a clinical depression at one point. But then one day I was reading The Dark Night of the Soul by St. John of the Cross and he was teaching that sometimes these very difficult things in our lives uh, are not a work of the devil or the flesh or sin, but actually they're gifts from God. They're parts of the cross that he sends into our lives intentionally uh, with, uh, to help shape us, to form us. So I looked at my relationship with my senior pastor and I decided, well, maybe that's a gift from God. So I embraced him. I said, this is God's gift to me. I'm gonna listen to him as I would to the voice of Jesus Christ. This is my senior pastor. And a funny thing happened, uh, after that I began to see ways in which he was a gift from God. I began to see ways in which I could learn from him. And as I embraced him in our relationship, I began to see that the, the, the two different gift sets began to work together in a way that was very fruitful and the ministry in the church just took off. And not only that, he became a mentor to me which prepared me for my next call. So, uh, an acceptance of God's providence, 
uh, especially for those people in our lives that are difficult, is foundational to begin finding ways for healing those relationships. Steps to relational healing. Step one, choose a relationship that's not going so good. Um, and begin with thanking God for this person. Look for strengths within this person. Look for things that are good about this relationship, things that are working. Two, admit uh, to the places uh, where it's broken, where things are not working. Be specific about hurts that you have inflicted or have received. Three, um, confess your uh, longings for this relationship, what it is that you wish this relationship would be. Um, give it over to the Lord. Give up control, surrender control, and ask Him to become Lord of this relationship for His expectations to be fulfilled, not yours. Four, confess any chronic complaining uh, that you might have been doing about the other person. Um, especially to other people. You need to be aware that Satan will also whisper lies to us about other people uh, or partial truths in order to keep us in conflict with them. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal these lies uh, and then to reveal what is the truth. Root up these lies and plant blessings instead. And finally, five, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you specific steps that you can take in order to bring healing into this relationship, actions uh, that you can do to begin to um, bring healing, to, 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 to bring reconciliation. Uh, write these steps down. This is the hard part, but it's also the good part. All right, so what are some hindrances to healing? Um, one, we might wonder uh, whether we should live in harmony with this other person. Maybe that's just the way that it is uh, for some people. Well, the good news or the hard news is that God wishes us to live in harmony with everyone, even our enemies. Um, we are to love our enemies. Uh, we are to pray for those that hurt us, that persecute us. So. Just because you're in conflict with a person um, doesn't mean that's the way it should be. That means that there's something out of whack and that God can work through you in order to bring reconciliation, in order to bring uh, at least forgiveness. Another is, if I forgive this person, am I somehow dismissing or minimizing what they've done to me? Uh, it's not. Uh, forgiveness is not an excuse uh, for what that person has done to you. Um, what it is, it's letting go of the right to retribution. It's, it's giving that person over to God and letting him be the judge and not you be the judge. Uh, another hindrance to healing is um, saying, well, I, I can't forgive another person because they're not willing to forgive me. Well, that's confusing forgiveness with reconciliation. Uh, forgiveness can be a one-way street. Um, it's not dependent upon our de forgiving another person. It's not depending upon the, our forgiving us. Um, it's just letting go of our bitterness and our anger and retribution. Uh, Jesus modeled this on the cross when he forgave those that were crucifying them. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. They, they didn't even know they were doing a sin. Um, reconciliation, though, is a two-way street. That's when both people have decided to seek uh, forgiveness or to seek a res restoration of the relationship. And that does take two, but that's something different than forgiveness. And finally, you might say, look, I, I'm just not ready to forgive this person. Um, I, I just don't have it within me. Uh, well, there's a couple of things going on here. One, if the hurt is just really there and you just can't let go of it, then that is a sign that you need, to, you need to seek inner healing. You need to, you have a wound there that needs to be addressed and, and you don't want to skip over that in order to get to forgiveness. That's, that, uh, that's not helpful. That's not true forgiveness. Uh, if you're finding yourself unable to forgive another person, then you might start asking God, what is it within me that is still wounded? 
what is it that needs to be attended to with me? And then um, the prayer ministry, prayer minister can help you gently deal with that wound and bring Jesus in to bring healing. And so that eventually there will be forgiveness. And then with that forgiveness, it doesn't even be something you want to do. It can just be an act of the will where you say, look, I'm still mad at this person, but I'm just going to let go of that anger. I'm going to let go of that madness. I'm just going to, as an act of the will, even though my feelings are nowhere close, I'm going to give them over to God and let God take care of them. So those are some of the hindrances to relational healing. Let's conclude with some words that Paul wrote to the Romans, chapter 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As we are talking about the healing ministry of Jesus, um, in this chapter, we're talking about letting that healing work that goes in us to overflow into our relationships. Um, for us to receive other people in our lives, especially the ones who we're in conflict with, with as gifts to be received, um, to see how we can release bitterness, release anger uh, in those relationships so that we can help be part of uh, the healing of the relationship, perhaps the healing of them as well, where Paul talks about uh, heaping burning coals on their head by being good to those that we're in conflict with. I don't think he means that as a way of sort of being passively aggressive. I, I think he's talking about maybe pricking their conscience where they will come to their senses and they would say, I, I think I need uh, to make some changes as well. Um, so in all of this, uh, as God calls us into community, uh, he calls us in the healing of the relationships to begin to see other people as ways to grow and mature uh, as uh, the body of Christ so that together we can model this kingdom of loving relationships that God intends for all creation. Please pray with me. God of heaven and earth, I ask that you would call to our minds and to our hearts, those in which we're in conflict with, and then begin to work in us a desire for forgiveness, a desire for reconciliation, and then give us some specific strategies for working this out. Um, Lord, help us to reflect the love that you have within yourself uh, and the way that we love those around us, especially those closest to us. I thank you and praise you for this great adventure that you've set us on. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and God bless you.